Um. You ready? Yep. <laughs> Hang on to your chairs, folks. Um, no, just <laughs> kidding. Just kidding. This is one of those things that when I first talked about how John structures his gospel, I said it doesn't really follow chronologically. It kind of follows theologically. And John has this way of introducing a topic and then kind of focusing in on it. Last week, we saw that incident where he cleared the temple and had that interaction with a lot of the Jewish religious leaders. Now, here's one of those times where John takes that concept and narrows it down even more. So we're going to see the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees. Who would like to read in chapter 10 or chapter 3, verses 1 through 8 for me? Catherine, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to read it. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's so much in each one of these little sections. We're not going to spend a lot of time digging them all, but I'm going to throw a few things out at you. Number one, why would Nicodemus show up at night? Um, he didn't want to be seen by the other, you know, you know yeah. yeah. <laughs> and my footnotes say um, he, 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 would be, he wouldn't have people all around him and whatever. Yep, yep. He could talk to him person to person. Yeah. And also being secretive so his cohorts won't know that he's there. Yep. <laughs> Do we ever have those times where we want to kind of keep our time with Jesus secret from others? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do. I love how he buttered Jesus up at the beginning. He's seeking, but he's also saying, oh, we know you're a man of God because no one could do these miracles. But Jesus doesn't bite. He jumps right in and says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Or another way that word is translated is born from above. So that concept of being born again or born from above. What does that mean? That whole born again thing is something that really got a bad rap in the 70s and 80s. But what does it mean to be born again? To willingly receive the spirit, I think. Yeah, it's a abrupt change in your life. We, Jim and I had a similar experience years ago. And you you just change direction mid, midstream in, in your in the things you're interested in, and there's this inner elation that just can't be explained or or understood really. Well, I like that. Hold on to that thought of that word elation, <laughs> this inner elation, because that's going to pop up in just a little bit. Um, what did Jesus mean when he says, "No one can enter the kingdom unless he's born of water and of the Spirit"? 
baptized? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, he's kind of pointing to baptism here. Now, remember that this whole idea of ceremonial washing for cleanliness and forgiveness wasn't new. But what Jesus is doing now is linking the Holy Spirit to that washing, that baptizing. That is new. It goes back to when Jesus himself was baptized and John said he saw the, the spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. So Jesus is really saying this is going to be the new normal for baptism. Goes right over Nicodemus's head. <laughs> Nicodemus is still focused on the physical act of being born. How can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? <laughs> so many times, especially in this next section here coming up, is Jesus is starting to talk about things on a deeper plane. He's starting to talk about things on a spiritual level. And even his own disciples who are with him all the time, still can't get over that hurdle of looking at things from a strictly physical standpoint. Do we struggle with that sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it is we, we like to live in our heads. You know, especially as 21st century Americans, you know, we, we really like to live in our heads. Even religiously, we live in our heads. We want to have rational explanations for things. And sometimes we really have a difficult time letting go of that part of us and just embracing Jesus as he is. That's kind of one of the reasons why Jesus said you need that faith of a little child. Little children don't try to question things. <laughs> they just come. You, you're going to hand them a present? Are they going to go, hmm, what's this for? It's not my birthday. It's not Christmas. They're going to see that, and they're just going to dive into it. And they may say thank you. They may not, but they're going to be excited that you're giving them something. That's what Jesus is really trying to get us to see in faith. And it's funny because we kind of go through this progression as believers, we kind of start out with that kind of fun, giddy type of faith where we have that enthusiasm, that joy. And then we become adults <laughs> or the adult brain kicks in and we start to think and rationalize and, and pull things apart and overanalyze them. And then as we get older and our faith matures more and more, we get back to that little kid part of us that just wants to embrace Jesus. Here, with Nicodemus, he's kind of being a little harsh. He's kind of being a little sarcastic. But what he's doing is really telling Nicodemus that you don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> So who would like to read verse 9 through, uh, let's go to 9 through 15. Who would like to read that? I can do it. Diane, go ahead. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and let you do, let you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of interesting things here. Um, in verses 11 and 12, Jesus switches grammatically here. He says, we speak of what we know. We testify to what we have seen. Who 
who's the we? Because Disciples. immediately shifts it. Pardon? Disciples and Jesus, yeah. and maybe Christians today. Bingo. Yeah. He's setting the stage here for what the church is going to bring to the world. Remember, I, I said in our introductory part that John's focus of this whole gospel is really looking to Jesus laying the foundation for the church to come. And this is one of those places where he starts to sneak that in. He says, we testify. But then he goes on and says, I have spoken to you. So he's really making this distinction, but yet lumping it together. When he says we, he's talking about the disciples. He's talking about the church to come. He's talking about every believer who confesses in him. I love that. But he also says, you don't, you don't believe us. <laughs> so don't be surprised when people don't believe you. <laughs> but he, he's setting that stage here. But then he talks about, to me, one of the most significant things in all of John's gospel. Remember at the beginning when we saw how John links us back into the Old Testament? How at the very beginning, he started out in the beginning and showed how Jesus was going to be linked with creation. Powerful, powerful passage. But here he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. So the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is one of those incidents that I think sometimes we overlook. Here's the background to that. The Israelites were going through the wilderness. They were grumbling and they were complaining. They didn't like the food. They didn't like where they were going. They didn't like Moses. They didn't like anything. A lot of them were saying, I just want to go back to Egypt. Now they were slaves in Egypt. But they didn't want their freedom. They didn't trust God. They just wanted to whine and complain about their situation. Boy, does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of do that, don't we? God says, okay, fine. You're going to reject me. Here's what I'm going to do. He sent poisonous snakes to go through the camp. And anyone who got bit by one of those snakes would die. Now, we see that as being very petty and judgmental. But really, Scripture is very clear. Paul says it best. The wages of sin or the consequence of sin is what? Death. And what's one of the most ultimate sins? Rejecting God. God is really saying, you want to reject me? Okay, fine. You're going to die. I'll just speed up the process. We'll make it happen quicker. <laughs> but he provided a way out. He had Moses take a bronze pole and wrap a bronze snake around it, go outside of the camp, out in the desert, plant that thing in the ground, and then tell everybody that if you're bit by the snake, you have two choices. You can either die or you can go outside of the camp and just look at that pole out there and live. That's your choice. Does that make logical sense? It makes absolutely no sense at all. It's an act of faith to go out and look at that pole and live. Jesus is saying, so too must I be lifted up. He's talking about his death. He's talking about his subsequent resurrection. He says, anybody who looks at me will live. 
Again, doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> but he's laying the groundwork here for really the message of the gospel. <clears throat> We've all been bitten by that snake. Thank you, serpent. Thank you, Adam and Eve. <laughs> We've all been bitten by that snake and we are all going to die. Now, not just a physical death. Sin causes a spiritual death. And that's a separation from God. That spiritual death is to be separated from God for all eternity. I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> but that's what it means. And what Jesus is saying here is that God is providing a way out. So we don't have to suffer the eternal consequences of that sin. We don't have to be separated from him forever. Again, doesn't make logical sense. We simply have to believe and trust. The Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Eternal life. What's an eternity? Forever. Forever and ever. And ever and ever. Yeah. And ever. <laughs> What's life? Hmm. Tougher question. <laughs> What's living, life? Living, breathing, and having your consciousness. Yeah. Is that physical or spiritual? That's physical. Physical? It's actually both. It's actually both. It's quite literally being fully alive physically and spiritually forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. When does eternal life begin? Another good question. <laughs> <laughs> when you physically die? No. When you're born. Huh. I'll just say when you believe. When Bingo! You believe. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Jesus is talking about that whole thing here when he's talking about being born again. When we come to faith... We are as spiritually alive as we will ever be. That's mind boggling. <laughs> but it's also a relief. Because it allows us to separate the physical from the spiritual, just as Jesus is doing here. So often we get so wrapped up in the physical side of life that we forget that there's a spiritual side as well. And especially as we get older and the end is drawing nearer and we can see that on the horizon, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the physical aspect of it. And one of the things that creeps in is this doubt and worry about what comes next. Thank you, Satan. <laughs> because if we truly understand this concept of eternal life being born of the Spirit, we have no worries. Having that firmly rooted faith deep inside really should allow us to face anything that life throws our way with 
without the fear. Oh, sure, we're going to have our human doubt and our human worry. That's just part of being human. But it shouldn't shake us to the core. And when it does rattle us deep inside, it gives us something to hang on to to pull ourselves back up out of that pit. Doesn't mean we're not going to go down that pit. <laughs> That's, again, part of the human experience. But what it offers is a way out. It gives us hope. It gives us that joy, that enthusiasm deep inside. With me so far? Yes. Okay. Who would like to read verse 16 through 21? I can. Susan? Susan was waving her hand there. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. How far do you want me to go? 21? Yeah, and, through 21. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. Thank you. Thank you. What does all that mean? In a nutshell, what does that mean? Jesus is the light of the world, and those that believe in the light uh, are true, and the, the other ones are left in the darkness. They do are just in the darkness, and they have they're condemned. Those are harsh words. Who does the condemning? Is it God? God? Jesus, God, Holy Spirit. You do it to yourself. What was that, Holda? Said you do it to yourself. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. That's the part of this passage that people forget. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Mm -hmm. People condemn themselves by simply unbelief, rejecting the light. We talked about that early on when John was talking about, John the Baptist was talking about the light has come into the world. We talked about all those things that light does it allows us to see it allows us to grow it illuminates our path all of those things when we reject that light of god that's come into the world we're rejecting god and just as we saw in that explanation of the snake in the wilderness rejecting god is what it's sin, sin. And yeah. sin leads to death. 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 Not just physical, but spiritual. spiritual death. Spiritual death. And we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Ouch. <laughs> we like to have scapegoats. <laughs> we like to blame somebody else. But Jesus is making it very clear here. You reject me, it's on you. The other thing I love about this discourse, he talks about men loved darkness more than light. Who's he talking to again? 
yourselves, ourselves. No, who's who's this conversation with? Oh, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. When did Nicodemus show up? At night. At night. At night. At night. <laughs> Secretive. It's very secretive at night. Yeah. So in effect, what Jesus is saying in a backhanded way to Nicodemus is that you, who don't understand what you're teaching, are lumped in with those evil guys. It's a pretty harsh condemnation. But he understood something about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was truly seeking. And when we get to the end of the story, what we find is that Nicodemus was one of the few Pharisees who actually believed in Jesus. And now, you could say what you want to about when that belief happened. I kind of tend to think it happened that night. When Jesus more or less said, you're, you're evil just like everybody else. But here, here's the message of the gospel. Believe me and live. Reject me and die. It's pretty much that simple. I love how Jesus doesn't pull punches. Yeah, Diane. I was just going to say, um, in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, Lindsay Freeman preached about Nicodemus. We had this text. And she said that he, he actually appeared at the foot of the cross. Yep. And, and he brought um, oils for anointing. And she said um, he probably would have had to stockpile those because they were so rare and so expensive that he couldn't have just gone out and gotten them on Saturday or Friday, whatever day it was. And so that he must have been making preparations. He must have understood what was coming yeah. and making preparations. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. And I had never heard that about Nicodemus before. I think it's fascinating. It truly is. But what I really love is it shows the impact that Jesus can have on a life. A life that started out doubting and questioning. A life that had been looking for the Messiah. Had one understanding of what the Messiah was. And now you're suddenly having your spiritual blinders removed and your heart opened up and you're starting to see what Jesus is truly all about in spite of your background, in spite of your education, in spite of what your friends and colleagues say. Jesus cuts through the clutter of all of that and gets right to the heart of the matter. I love that. Love that. Who would like to read verses 22 through 30 for me? This is one of those transitional pieces in John. Okay, Helen, go for it. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he spent some time with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Aeon near Sa Near Sal Salem. John the Baptist. What? I'm sorry, what, Catherine? Keep going. John also was baptizing at Aeon near Salem because water was abundant there, and people kept coming and were being baptized. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. Now a discussion about the purification arose between John's disciple and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan to whom you testified, here he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride of the he who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears and she hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been 
fulfilled. He must increase, but I must de decrease. Thanks. Quick background. John the Baptist is still there, still baptizing. Even though he knows who Jesus is, he's still baptizing to point people to Jesus. Now, Jesus is there. He's also baptizing. Well, actually, it wasn't Jesus doing the baptism. It was his disciples. And somebody points it out, says, John, you know that guy you talked about? He's over there, and everybody's going to him. And John just kind of had that, ha, ah, my work here is finished. <laughs> my work here is finished. He talks about a couple of times there about being full of joy. And that joy is now complete. It's that overwhelming sense of accomplishment when your job is done. Here's the million dollar question. What's joy? <laughs> Supreme happiness. Supreme happiness. I like that. I like that. <clears throat> Elation without doubt. Elation without doubt. Where does joy come from? I want to say the heart. <laughs> Yeah. Inside, heart Inside. or soul, heart or yeah. soul. It's not really dependent on external circumstances. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy really comes bubbling up. <laughs> and John is saying, I have that joy. because he sees that his work is done, that God has not abandoned him. God sent him out there to be the forerunner, to be the voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. And he sees that and he goes, ha, ah, it worked. <laughs> They're all going to him now. There's an interesting little note that we, we miss it in our English translations. I don't often like to do this because sometimes when we pick on the Greek grammar so much that some people tend to do, um, we start to lose confidence in our English translations. But once in a while, you need to kind of pull something up to help you get the better feeling of what that word is really saying. He said, that joy is mine. It is now complete. That word complete or now complete is in the perfect tense. And what that means is that it will remain. What John is saying here is that he will have that joy forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It will remain. It won't be taken away. Even though he's going to be put in prison and die, that joy will still be there. Mm. I like that. Mm. Because it's that same joy that we get. It's that same joy that comes to us through faith. Who would like to read 31 through the end of chapter 3? Just another little short verse. Vita, go for it. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth, and of the earth he speaks. He who comes from heaven is above all. 
He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. He who receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for it is not by measure that he gives the Spirit. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. Thanks. It's kind of a summary of what this whole section is about. Jesus, who comes from above, is speaking the words of God. It's that whole idea of, again, being the light that illuminates for us, being that light that allows us to see God. In a nutshell, you want to know more about God, learn more about Jesus. <laughs> no Jesus, no God. Now, John is going to shift gears a little bit. Jesus is about to start a journey where he's going to have less to do with the quote-unquote religious people and more to do with the people people. It's kind of like with the story of Nicodemus, he kind of plants a flag down there and says, okay, now we're going to pivot and we're going to go down another road. We're just going to start touching on this encounter with a Samaritan woman because for me, that's probably the second most powerful encounter that Jesus had apart from the one with Nicodemus. There's so much depth to it that we're not even going to be able to begin to touch on it this week, but I want us to start to get into it to get the background so we have some time to have the juices flowing for next time. Who would like to read verses four through six for me? Marilyn? Yeah, okay, so four, one through six? Yes. Okay. When therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Thanks, or noon, heat of the day. Um, why would Jesus leave? Words gotten out to the Pharisees that Jesus is baptizing and gaining disciples. Why would he leave? He's becoming a target. Pardon? He's becoming a target. Becoming a target. It says in my footnotes, his yeah, mission, it was his mission, starting his mission. Yep. And it wasn't to stay there. It was to go somewhere else, I guess. Yep. And to avoid the opposition of the Pharisees, my footnote says. Yeah, mine too. It says that they were hostile yep. to John, and I'm guess guessing that might have been John the Baptist. And then yep. now they're now they're turning on Jesus. Yep. Yeah. And there will come a time when they're going to turn on him. In fact, he's going to spend some time poking them enough that they not only turn on him, but they kill him. Mm -hmm. But it's not time for that yet. Right. And rather than waste time and energy on a confrontation that's going to happen later down the road, Jesus simply says, okay, we're out of here. Yeah, Helen. <laughs> is, is he going alone into Samaria? Did he leave his disciples behind to baptize? Nope. The, the disciples are with him. Okay. They say that it, they went into town to get food. Yep. They left to go get food. But 
to me, there's an absolute beautiful, beautiful little statement in here. Now he had to go through Samaria. Oh. He had to go through Samaria. Here's the fun part. No God-fearing Jew would travel through Samaria. When you were going from Jerusalem to Galilee or Galilee to Jerusalem, there's two routes that the Jews would take. One was to go to the shore of the Mediterranean and follow that coastline up and over. The other was to follow the Jordan River through the mountains and everything. Both of those paths were harder and took longer. The shortest route was to go directly through north and south, directly through this region called Samaria. And the Jews would not go there because those people lived there. Yeah. They were very prejudiced against them. They were incredibly prejudiced against them. Now, they still are. They still are, yeah. The Samaritans today it would be descendants of the Palestinians. The Palestinians would, would be descendants of the Samaritans. Oh. They were part Jewish, part Arab. Remember the song in the 60s that Cher had half breed? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we would have called them at the time. Mm. They were not accepted by either side. They were rejected by the Jews. They were rejected by the Arabs. So they just had their own little spot right there. But as we're going to see, as they still had this tie to the Jews of the Old Testament. They had Jacob's well there. That's where they would go get their water. We're going to see that the, the woman that he encounters is versed in religion. She understands this whole idea. Let's have a question. Yes. So why did Jesus have to take the third way that was not recommended or culturally appropriate? What, how does that work out? Because of this encounter. He had, he had to go there because by fate or God directed him to go there. I believe God directed him. The spirit directed him. He knew that he was going to have an encounter here that was going to change everything for a lot of people for the purpose of meeting him. Yep. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. Sometimes encounters that we have have been ordained by things far greater than us. God will put people in our path to strengthen us, test us, challenge us, support us, or give us the opportunity to be his hands and feet to somebody else in the world. I don't know how to break this to you folks. Life isn't about us. <laughs> it's not about us at all. It's about what God can do through us. And Jesus is modeling that here, not just for that woman, but for his own followers. I'm sure when they were starting down that path, his disciples were going, uh -uh, boss, boss, um, uh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Do you, do you know where you're going? <laughs> we don't go that way. We go that way. We don't, no, we don't do that. <laughs> but Jesus was showing them that there is another way to view people. Not as outcasts, not as objects of scorn and hate, but as human beings.
I'm not going to expand on this much, but I want you to I want you to think about this before we go. It's noon. The heat of the day. Jesus is sitting at the well. And a woman shows up to draw water. She shouldn't have been there. Drawing water was a cultural, it was a social event. All the women of the town would have gathered in the morning. They would have been sharing stories, talking about, you know, the kids, what, you know, what are you having for dinner tonight? All in helping each other fill their jars, all while they were just interacting. But this woman wasn't part of that. The Samaritans themselves were outcast. She is an outcast amongst outcasts. And Jesus had to go so he could have this encounter. It's really interesting how um, he picks, you know, always the person who is usually the least heard, you know, like a blind beggar last mm -hmm. week. And, and this woman who, you know, has no standing in the community. Um, we had uh, somebody filling in for Catherine uh, a week ago Sunday and this and th this reading and, and then we did gospel based discipleship on it the other day um, said that the I did not realize this likely the reason this woman had five husbands is because they would have divorced her because she didn't have children. And I thought it was always it's presented as her moral failing that she's had five husbands and, or at least that's what I feel like we're supposed to infer, but it's interesting that no way she, she likely didn't cause her status in this community by her own actions. And so Jesus is going to speak to all of the Samaritans through her. I just find yep. that fascinating. But she also embraced that status by not even bother, bothering to marry mm -hmm. the person she was with now. Yeah, I think she gave up. She gave up. Yeah. Bingo. She gave up, but she was still looking for something. But she just simply gave up and gave in to the pressures of her society to say, okay, you think I'm a tramp? I'll act like one. There is so much to that, but I want to leave us with this question. Who are our Samaritans? Who are the people in our world that we go out of our way to avoid, that we judge, that we want nothing to do with, and who our friends and families would not understand? If we had anything to do with them, don't answer, not, not yet, but just think about that and ponder that because that's going to play into how we react to this encounter. But that's all I got. I had a question. If, the, way. if the, the Jewish people um, despised or whatever the Samaritans, how did the Samaritans feel about the Jewish people? Kind of that same thing. Maybe they they have been hostile toward Jewish people traveling through Samaria. Well, first of all, that wouldn't have happened. Very few would have traveled through there. I don't think it would be hostile. I think it would have been more avoidance. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to go out of their way to attack a, a group of Jewish people traveling through, mm -hmm. but they weren't going to go out of their way and offer hospitality either which again is totally against the culture. This was a very hospitable culture. But when you reject people simply because of who they are, 
are they really going to be so excited to have you over for dinner? No. <laughs> no. No. Which we can learn from that, by the way. But that's a whole nother <laughs> discussion. I'm going to shut up now. You guys will have to listen to me on Sunday because I'm preaching. So, um... okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you're you welcome. so much. Thanks, Basil.